Welcome everyone to Textiles and Tea. My name is Kathy Crew, and I'm with the Hand Weavers Guild of America. I'm the Advertising and Marketing Manager and your host today. Today's Textile and Tea is sponsored by The Woolery. Go to their website and see all the wonderful collections of fiber supplies. We welcome your questions and we will answer as many as we can today. If you can, please use the Q&A button and not the chat. Um, if you put the question in chat, it can get lost and we won't be able to get to it. Today, I'm excited that we have Natalie Niebach here today as our guest. Natalie explores the intersection of art and science by translating scientific data related to meteorology, ecology, and oceanography into woven sculptures and musical scores and performances. Her main method of data translation is using basket weaving, as you see here, um, to interpret the data into a 3D space. Central to her work is to explore the role visual and musical aesthetics play in the translation and understanding of the complex scientific systems, such as weather. Natalie is a recipient of numerous awards and residencies, including a Pollock Krasner Award, the Virginia A. Groot Foundation Award, the TED Global Fellowship, two Massachusetts Cultural Council Fellowships. She did her undergraduate work in Chinese and political science at Oberlin College and received an MFA in sculpture and an MS in art education from the Massachusetts College of Art. Her work has been shown in the US, Canada, Europe, Australia, and has been reviewed by publications, and I love this part, spanning from fine arts to design to technology. Welcome. Natalie, it's wonderful to have you here. Hi, Kathy. Thanks so much for having me. And hello to everyone who I cannot see right now. I'm delighted to have tea with you this afternoon. Well, this is great. Um, first thing we always ask, the most important question is, what kind of tea do you like? Well, I was prepared for this, so I made myself a cup of tea. Uh, I am very... Uh, I'm very, un I guess, unexcited, but I love Earl Grey and that's my fallback and that's what I drink. So I made myself a cup just for you all. Oh, thank you. We appreciate that. <laughs> well, let's start with how did your journey go from a political science degree to becoming a sculptor? Yeah, so first of all, welcome to my studio space. In the background, what you see is not a background image, but it's actually the actual space where I make all my work. And almost everything that you see in the background here is based on data with some exceptions like these things that are not, but everything else is based on data. And <clears throat> my journey is a very windy road. Uh, I definitely got into the arts later in my life. It wasn't until my, I was in my 30s that I began to think of myself as an artist. And prior to that, I did a lot of other things, including uh, a degree in political science. So weirdly enough, it was actually the degree in political science that got me interested in the arts. So <clears throat> bear with me and I'll keep it short. But in 1995 to 1997, I was in Indonesia on a fellowship to teach English as a second language. And at the time, there was a dictatorship uh, by Soharto, and he was losing power. So the whole, um, the, there was a lot of political unrest that was bubbling up. And I was teaching at a university that was very politically active, sort of the Berkeley of Indonesia, if you want to sort of make a comparison to the 1960s. And <clears throat> It was the artists who were the most vocal about what was going on. And so by hanging out with artists, especially contemporary artists, you got a sense of what was what people were talking about politically. Um, it was the arts were sort of seen as the safe venue to discuss politically sensitive issues. And so I started to hang out with a lot of artists, mainly because of my interest in politics and watching them and seeing how they were using the arts, not just as an expressive tool, but also as a way of thinking this very complicated political situation through really inspired me. And so when I came back to the States afterwards, I really wanted to do something with the arts. And I ended up uh, going for an art education degree first because I very much make my living with my art and I don't, I don't have anybody supporting me. So I had to be very realistic and uh, going into art education seemed like a, you know, job security. So I did my undergrad in, in uh, I did my graduate degree in art education and it was 
through that that I began to start start looking at science because my thesis was looking at was integrating already science education into the arts. And so I started taking science classes. Um, but what was really the breakthrough was what happened in 2000 when I started taking science classes at um, Harvard University in their night school division. So a little tidbit back then, the cheapest way to take an, a science class in, in Boston during that time uh, was to go to Harvard in their night school division. So I took that class. And at the same time, I was taking a basket weaving class with Lois Russell just down the street at Cambridge Adult Ed. So I was sort of in the serendipitous moment where I was studying this incredible science and I was learning these basket weaving techniques and that all sort of came together. Um, I ended up using basket weaving. My very first sculpture that I made out of basketry was uh, taking a diagram from, their, from the astronomy book that I was studying and transforming that into a 3D object. So, and something really came together for me. Like the, there was now finally a purpose towards all that art making, which was to investigate science. And I'm so glad I found that. That's amazing. Um, so you decided to be, you know, you were doing all these other things, the education. How did, how and when did you decide, okay, I'm just gonna be a full-time artist? Yeah, so by the time I'd finished my, so after my MSA, after my master in art education, I went back and got an MFA in sculpture. And, you know, by that time I was in my mid thirties, I had two graduate degrees. I had learned to live frugally because you don't do two graduate degrees, work a zillion jobs and not learn how to be frugal. And uh, I just thought, you know, there's never gonna be a perfect time. And if I don't do this now, then I'm gonna just get back into some sort of nine to five job and it'll remain this hobby forever and I'll regret it for the rest of my life. But the other reason was that I found myself teaching, you know, cause my, my job security degree was in art education and I was involved in art education and I just felt like a fraud because I kept, I felt like I was teaching these skills but I didn't really understand what it meant to be a working artist. And I felt like, especially if I was gonna teach at a university level, I didn't wanna be the teacher who never understand, who you know is really good at making art, but doesn't understand what the reality is of, of being a working artist. And so I wanted to be, I wanted to understand that better. So that's why I decided to give myself two years, try this working artist thing, and then maybe go back to a full-time job. But then I realized, no, this is this is this is the life. It's it's hard. It's filled with insecurities, especially now with this pandemic. But it's so worthwhile, and I think it's made me a much better teacher. It's it's a brave leap. I I admire you for doing that. Um, and and speaking of the pandemic, you became a full time artist in two thousand seven, correct? Yeah. Well, right after that, the recession hit, right? And now we're in the middle of this pandemic. So how do you cope? What did you do then? What are you doing now? How do you cope with this basic shutdowns as an artist? What do you do? Yeah. So in many ways, 2007 was sort of the worst time to become a full-time artist, but also the best of times. And I feel that's very same, that's very much the case right now. There's a lot of opportunities that are actually right at your, at your, um, you know, doorstep if you just kind of grab them right now. So the way that one thing I love about being a full time artist is that you have to be very realistic and very sober in, in how you um, make your living. So you can't just make one art, kind of artwork. You have to make you have to sort of find different ways of generating income. So already you have to become sort of chameleon uh, in many ways. And there were two things that I did early on during the recession that um, were very helpful in keeping me, helping me keep a financially sustainable studio practice. The first thing I did was when 2007 hit, I told myself, whatever you do, try to remain visible. So mm -hmm. I didn't want to just disappear. I wanted to somehow, even if the exhibitions weren't going on right now, I wanted to stay alive on social media. I wanted to, or back then they didn't, that wasn't really the case, but I wanted to kind of keep showing, keep showing, keep showing. And what that meant for me was to make my work shippable. So prior to that, I'd always be working with art handlers and things like that. So the first thing I did when I got my new studio in Boston is I taped a 24 inch square on my floor. So everything I built would fit that 24 inch square. So if I 
if I show you the very briefly, the very messy side of the studio, you'll see all these 24 inch boxes. Those, so everything I built fits a 24 inch box. And so that meant I can ship things FedEx round. The second thing I learned is you never make it on your own. You need other artists, you need other people to help you get through this and other people need you. So you can't just kind of, you know, hide or just kind of do it on your own. Um, we need each other right now. And those when March hit 2020, uh, I had total cancellations. Everything was canceled for the for the next two years uh, forward. And I was in serious doubt whether I could even keep the studio. So I sort of went back to um, my survival mode of 2007 and looked at those two rules that I just said, you know, make it shippable and reach out to other people because you're going to need other people to get through this. So the way I responded in March was I stopped making sculptures altogether. So I started making a a, a series of weavings that are two dimensional because I wasn't even sure if I could keep the studio. So I thought if I'm going to keep making work, at least I don't want this to be another thing I don't know where to put. So everything became 2D. And the second thing I did is I started a business. I started a home decor business. Oh, thank you, right on cue, uh, called Spiders and Birds, named after the two greatest weavers on the planet, I think. So this is a home decor line that is very much geared towards um, the uh, customers who love play and who love to uh, you know, surround themselves with objects that are playful. These are all hand woven playful lamps that can be converted into table or pendant lamps, but they also have this component of uh, um, beads that you can use to transform your lamp into various crazy characters such as a strange little bumblebee that you see in the middle. So those were my approaches. And I went to, uh, for Spiders and Birds and, and particularly, I joined a business incubator uh, at my university. And so now I'm in the classroom with 30 other entrepreneurs and by far the oldest. Uh, and it's really humbling. <laughs> and wonderful at the same time. So I'm, so those are the, that, that's how I've responded and just basically saying yes to absolutely everything that comes into your inbox. I, I love the way you, you, you kind of think this through. It's amazing, especially the square, the 24 inch square that that's amazing. Um, I wanted to bring up, there's a beautiful series called Weaving Weather During Quarantine. How did you come up with that idea? Yeah, so a lot of my work, I know it looks very playful and you'll see some examples of that later on as well, some more sculptural examples. The work looks very playful, but underneath all that playfulness and all that color is usually some sort of structural logic that's based on numbers. And so this is a series of weavings I did uh, using watercolor paper in Mar starting in March and April when I was stuck in the apartment and I couldn't get to the studio. Mm -hmm. And these are weavings that use a hexagon base structure, but then uh, add additional weavers that are all color coded to represent different temperature and cloud cover. So a lot of what I focus on in my work is weather data. And when the pandemic hit, I, you know, I was in panic mode. Uh, I didn't know if this was the end of my career. I didn't know what was going to happen. And we were all stuck in our apartments and we couldn't go outside. And I live in a very urban place, so I, I don't have a backyard and I can't just sit out and sidewalk and sip my tea. <laughs> it doesn't work. So going outside, um, so weather became this, this inaccessible thing. I couldn't go outside because I had to wear the mask and it became this fraught you know, thing where if you go outside, everybody just gives you nasty looks because you're not wearing it correctly or whatever. It became this sort of, weather became inaccessible. So I started by first translating weather. And then because I have family members that are scattered all over the globe that I haven't seen since the pandemic, I started to also weave weather, weather data from their location. So that's how some of, some of those weavings are actually hexagon. So the three directions of the hexagon are the three locations where I have family members in quarantine. And then after in, this, in the summertime, I started to add COVID data into these weavings too. So the patterns got even more complicated. And one thing that I always love is to incorporate, incorporate an element of surprise. So these weavings all have two sides. The, the, 
the front side, I plan out. So I know exactly, you know, the blue is going to represent 30 miles per hour wind and the green is going to represent 20 degree, uh, you know, 45 degree Fahrenheit or something. But the backside are colors that I don't necessarily plan out. So, and I don't flip the piece over until it's all done. So there's always this <gasps> moment when you flip it over. And usually I like the backside more, of course, because I didn't think it, you know, I didn't overthink it so much. So that's how those came about. That's a great way of um, lemons to lemonade, you know, if you're stuck at home, you take a different direction. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm kind of shifting gears here. Most of us know about STEM to STEAM. Uh, if you don't, STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And the STEAM part is for the art, arts being added into that. So it's S-T-A-E-A-M, -E STEAM. And you were in, we have some images of a project that you worked on in North Carolina with students about the effects. I believe it was Hurricane Florence that tore through North Carolina. Can you talk about this project? You can see the flooding on that one image. It was amazing. Sure, yeah. So this was a project I did in 2019 with the uh, Eastern Carolina University and the National Science Foundation. And we worked with um, three middle schools uh, down there. And Hurricane Florence happened in 2018 and it caused widespread flooding. Uh, and the three middle schools that we were working with were in some of the most rural counties of North Carolina and some of the counties that had been hardest hit by the flooding. So all the, the students that, that I work with all either lost their homes or uh, had relatives living with them who had lost their homes. And so I worked with them, three middle schools, uh, two art schools and one uh, school that was, that, uh, and, and one music school. And I worked with them in, uh, translating data from Hurricane Florence and incorporating their own personal stories into, into the sculpture or the musical score that they were building. And it became a really surprising, cathartic experience for them because for many of them, it was the first time that they had actually processed what was going on. And they really flourished with this. And they didn't just make, I went in there making sculptures with them and, and with the music uh, group, I ended up helping them build a musical score. But they ended up making so many more things. They ended up writing a poem. They ended up making paintings. So it sort of was this catalyst of all the stuff that had been, you know, boiled or kind of kept inside and finally let out. And even though, you know, the data was sort of the, the, the way that we could justify it with the National Science Foundation, I think what the students got out of this experience more was just the opportunity to just express what had been happening to them. and. So those are the great, those are great projects where uh, you get to work with a, with some super awesome science teachers and art teachers and get them to bring the arts and the science together in a way that I don't think any of them really expected mm -hmm. quite the way it came now, out. Now, was this part of, um, you did a residency at East Carolina. Was that part of that? Yes, exactly. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. So just to oh. kind of flesh it, flesh it out, if I may, Kathy. So uh, I think part of the reason why my work is very oftentimes found within the STEAM world is because I think it, it, it kind of grew up with STEM education. I realized that STEM also kind of started in 2000. That's when I started. My first audience were science teachers. The art world didn't want to have anything to do with me at the beginning, um, but it was the science teachers who I brought my work towards the, fir the first, and I think they really gravitated it towards it because it was a way of making information tactile. And mm -hmm. for the, that's something they were really missing in their classes. And, and this is continuing now. I mean, I'm now working with, um, I'm right now we're talking about a residency with Boston University working with public health uh, university students and how do you make information, not just tactile, but how do you make information related to vaccine distribution and, uh, you know, COVID death rates and infection rates and bringing up the whole and, and bringing in a whole lens of inequities that, that this pandemic has revealed in our healthcare system. How do you tell compelling stories with that? And so we're exploring lots of different ways of um, sculptural projects, music projects, just not necessarily to create pretty objects, but to get people to talk about and to 
understand maybe the complexity that this pandemic has revealed in terms of who it's affecting and who is getting the vaccines and who isn't. Well, Whitney and I were talking about how we wanted to word it so it didn't sound like, you know, two days after the hurricane, you were there doing art with them because that's obviously not how it happened. But in a way, it sounded like you also provided something for those kids that was way down the list probably of what needed to happen. That way, ability for them to express something was probably way down the list of get water, get food, get clothing, get a place to live. So that's just amazing. And I have to say, you did STEAM before STEAM was cool. So there good you for go. you. Good for you. <laughs> that's true, yeah. Yeah, that's very true. And, and I mean, um, I think there's actually a lot of value in going into and doing these kind of projects a year after because hurricanes, hurricanes linger in communities long after they are gone. And what was also really interesting for me to see is, is the real divide between what hurricane recovery looks like in an urban setting versus a rural setting. You could still see the evidence of Hurricane Florence in many of these, these places that, that I was working with. You could, there, the damage was, was still there. There were piles and piles of, there were fields that were just filled with old refrigerators, old furniture, the stuff that had been just lost in the flood. And you know, a lot of the age just never really made it to those rural, uh, to this rural communities and they had to rely on their own network to, to get things up and going. And so I, yeah, I do think there's a long-term healing or processing effect that, that uh, any kind of natural disaster brings with it. And I think you're absolutely right. Right when the, the hurricane hits, the last thing I want to do is come with a bunch of crayons and say, hey, what do you think? You know, it's, it, we have to kind of process what's happening. But I think it's really important to have that opportunity to, to understand kind of what happened in the context of, okay, we've made it through the worst. Now let's, let's draw some lessons from this. And... Well, in another life, I was an art therapist. So at some point in time, we'll have to talk because that's what we did. That was, that's awesome. So anyway, I want to, I'm going to move on. Um, okay. This next piece I love, it's called the ghostly crew of the Andrea Gale. And it's about the ship that went missing in the perfect storm. Um, there's a movie by that name. It's a good movie. Um, this work was part of a musical performance also. Can you talk about how that came about? Sure. So uh, the Andrea Gale is the name of a ship that sank during the perfect storm in 1991. And it's called the perfect storm because it was, a, it was actually two storm systems. It was a, a depression in the north called the the Halloween storm or the tropical depression in the north and Hurricane Grace near Bermuda. And those two storm systems sort of fit this really interesting, unusual dance around each other. And they sucked energy. They one as Hurricane Grace was dying, it's the, the tropical depression sucked the energy off that hurricane and just became the perfect storm. And I was interested in the storm because meteorologically speaking, it's the sort of storm that really should only happen on a computer model and never in real life, but it did. And I wanted to tie it in with a, a human story to give this storm a more of a, um, of a realness to it rather than just a bunch of numbers on a, on a spreadsheet. And so what I did for this piece is I wrote a musical score that follows the journey of this boat as it was fishing up in Nova Scotia and goes down to, and is sort of out there way too long and then kind of as the storm brews and gets really, really bad, it starts to turn back towards Boston, but then sinks somewhere near um, near a, a little island called Sable Island. And um, if you can go back just just for a second to the other sculpture, the previous image, the the sculpture that you see is a boat, and it is a boat with these big wheels, and it's a reference to life-saving boats in, in in New England. That whenever there was a big schooner that was ship, shipwrecked. They would wheel out these tiny boats to to help those those ships out in the waters. The wheels translate title um, uh, uh, title calendars of both Boston and Nova Scotia, and these masts that you see in the middle these are the three these are three different segments of that ship's journey um, as it tries to go back towards Boston. And then the the dragons there's a there's a, a, a an orange dragon on the back side and a blue dragon on the front side. These are the two. It's, the blue dragon is the laboratory current and the, the orange dragon that you can't see is the Gulf Stream. And they're sort of 
weaving around this boat and it's the differentiation that's causing a lot of this, this um, it's contributing a lot to the storm itself. Uh, so if you can go back to the next slide now, here's an, an image of uh, a segment of the musical score that is using only, um, temp, uh, excuse me, only wind and pressure data. And it's really just a graph and it doesn't even look like a musical score. And you can see one of the masts on the other side, uh, that's a sculpture that, that is kind of gives you a sense of the complexity of it. And I work with composers in translating these musical scores. And you're gonna hear now a piece by Matthew Jackford, who is a West Virginian composer. And this is a, a piece where, this is the night that the Andrea Gale sank. And so you'll hear the, in his musical composition, da -da 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 -da. that's actually the wind the wind moving up in scale. So he's actually using actual data to create that structure. And let's listen to it until about halfway. There's a, there, there's a, a violin that's coming in and the violin plays a fishing shanty that, that is about, and the fishing shanty is about a shipwreck that happened in New England waters. So Whitney, if you can turn it on now, that'd be great. Thank you. Wow, that's that's so uh, touching. It's just really impacts you listening to that. That's amazing. Well, it's also one of the reasons why I got interested in music because I wanted the emotional aspect mm -hmm. of data to come to become part of the conversation. And um, I have a hard time doing that with sculpture. And I'm not sure if it's because we're so used to, we're, we're so kind of programmed to interact with an object in a certain way that it's, or it's really hard for me to get emotions into the translation process of a sculptural piece. It, we're much more open to, in a sense, responding emotionally to a piece of music, I think. And so music was a way of bringing in an emotional kind of lens through which the data can be experienced or maybe even understood. Well, I want to talk some about the sizes of your work. Some of your pieces are like on tabletops, like you said, the 24 inches, <laughs> but you also have these large installations. And this next image is the sibling rivalry. And it's a great example of a large installation. You can really see the scale with the person in the image. Um, so can you talk some about your preference in working? Do you like the large installations? Would you rather do the smaller? Um, I like all, I, I love making large installations, but they do take an awful lot of time to make. Uh, the the large scale pieces came about because um, of the spaces that I have been given. You know, oftentimes as a sculptor, you get these massive gallery spaces and your sculptures are like this big and you're like, ay, yeah, yeah, how am I gonna fill this space? So that's sort of how I started to make wall pieces was just simply feel like I had to sort of fill the walls a little bit more uh, this particular piece was my second 
uh, wall piece. And I wanted to really engulf the viewer into the information and into the story uh, of these pieces. This is a piece on Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Sandy. And it's essentially a map of New Orleans in a very rough way. Uh, and, um, and I just wanted to kind of to get the viewer engaged in it. This was also, the, this was first made for the Akron Art Museum in 2016 for a show called Intersections. And it had some really heavy hitters in the show, meaning really well-known artists like Ann Lindbergh, Judy Pfaff, Ursula von Riddingsward, John Newman. And I was the junior junior of the, of the artists in there and they gave me this massive wall. And so I felt like, I gotta do something to give an impact. And I, I'm so glad I did. I uh, just, they gave me this 24 or 25 foot wall piece and I just decided I'm gonna cover the whole thing with it. Uh, so, you know, exhibitions, what I love about exhibitions is that you never know what kind of space you're getting. And sometimes uh, these spaces really can bring out ways of working with scale or function or um, that you've never done before. And I love those challenges. So I've, a lot of these large scale pieces came because I kept getting these big walls. <laughs> Well, this wasn't one of the questions we talked about earlier, but I have to ask, where do you start? Do you, do you draw something out first? Do you put it out on a computer first and then start no. making it or? No, if you go back to that image for just a second, um, I can show you how it started. First of all, this image, the, the big wall piece is 25 inches long. My studio is at longest 15 inches. 15 feet, excuse me, why the tiny studio? <laughs> 15 feet. So you can see how the, the composition is sort of condensed into the middle. So those are the 15 feet in my studio and everything else uh, on the outside is done on site. It started with this diagonal kind of bluish line that was cut jutting across. And I just wanted to have a very strong something that created that diagonal in that big rectangle. And since I was talking about uh, hurricanes, Hurricane Katrina, I thought, let me start with the Mississippi. And so that's sort of how it started. And then you immediately divided up the space into you know, the upper part and the lower part. And the upper part is um, Hurricane Katrina and the lower part is Hurricane Sandy. And then I threw everything under the sun onto the wall. I mean, I would drag everything I had in the, in the studio as, as absurd as it was just to throw it on the wall. And that's sort of how I started to kind of understand, okay, so this is really a city map. Okay, so it's a city map. So then I can maybe put in the levees that broke. And so it's a, a lot of it was just starting with not knowing where this was going and then just throwing everything visual on the wall, not even realizing, you know, how I was gonna approach Katrina. And then through that kind of having all these visual inputs, then finally deciding, okay, this needs to be, a solid area of, of red. What can I make that's that red? Okay, it could be part of the city plan. Okay, and then I need something to counter all those rectangles. Well, let me put a wheel there and that wheel can now become the weather data. And so it's a, it's a, it's a sort of a visual storytelling that begins with just throwing a lot of stuff on the wall and not really knowing where it's going at the beginning. So thank you, Whitney, for bringing that back up. That's, that's amazing. It's just amazing. I love that. And it really changes how you view it when you understand a little more about what that means and what this means and that sort of thing. Well, I'm, I want to go on to the next one. Um, some of your installations are commissions, um, such as the work, The Waters of Copley Square. How did this project come about and how do you feel about commissions? So this was a piece um, I did for a privacy firm, the IAPP in um, New Hampshire. And this is called The Watchers of Copley Square. And it is a piece that translates weather data and privacy data uh, into this one, in, into this form that I think um, looks a little bit like a twirly toy. Um, and it essentially, the, the, the platform of it is a map of Boston and it incorporates two different um, events that have significantly changed the way Copley Square is experienced. Copley Square is a major square in Boston. It's where the public library is. We have the 
the Copley Church there, which is this very iconic, beautiful church. It's a, it's a place where lots of tourists come. It's the place where I was at when 9-11 happened. I was working in a little cafe there. And it's also a place where the April uh, 2015 bombing took place, the marathon bombing. And throughout the years, especially after these two events, the, enor the amount of surveillance that um, is visible on that square is, is enormous. You cannot walk through that square without being filmed at least five times, either by tourists or by all these cameras that are around. So I, I was taking that kind of square as the beginning point for this commission. So commissions are interesting. Um, I love working, I love doing commissions. They're hard because you oftentimes are working with data sets that you're not familiar with. And you know, there's sometimes this perception of like, oh, you know, you work with weather data, so no problem, you can work with, you know, me medical data or or healthcare data. And, and no, these they're they, every set of data has its own, there's just an umbrella of knowledge that you have to know to really understand what that data is telling me and how it fits into other data sets and so forth. So working with data I'm not familiar with really pulls me out of my comfort zone, which I love. Um, they are also a way of paying the bills. Uh, and they're also, again, a way of working with spaces that you don't necessarily would choose yourself. You know, for example, a lot of commissions are for high traffic areas. Well, a lot of wall pieces I make are very fragile. So how do you make a piece, a wall piece or a, a sculptural piece that can take the, just the, you know, the, the movement of human beings who have other things on their mind than a piece of artwork that's standing right in the middle of their path. So how do you negotiate human behavior with your sculpture and how do you get people to, to stop? I think one of my, the hardest commissions I've ever done was for an airport. I mean, who stops at an airport to look at artwork? I do. So it's, you know, cause you have all these other things going on in your head. How do you get people to stop in these places that don't, they don't expect to find art? So again, these are challenges that you have never ever come upon in my studio. I think the hardest thing, the hardest thing for me to do is to get out of the comfort zone of the studio. If you never, if I never leave the studio, I'm, I, Build these blinders and I keep doing the same thing over and over again and it's by doing commissions it's by collaborating with other people that I'm constantly being pulled out of my comfort zone and that's when I think really exciting work can happen because that's where the growing happens if you just do the same thing over and over again then what's the point I guess oh Kathy you're muted I'm sorry, um, I've never done a commission. So, you know, what do I know? But I, it's amazing all the things you have to think about um, when you're working on something like that. Oh, um, a couple of people have asked, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, well then that, that's, that's the creative part of it. But then there's all, you know, commissions really help you, uh, help you, help your negotiation skills. So you, there's all this other part of, of uh, commissions where you have to learn how to, you know, you read the contract carefully. Do you have a contract? and. How do you get liability insurance and da da da? So there's there's the learning curve is huge with commissions. Many of which many of the things that you have to, that I think I had to learn have nothing to do with art making. I think it could be a class for convergence. We'll have to talk about that. <laughs> the next question I have for you is that your your topics are very serious. You know the you know the the hurricanes, um, climate change, and the impact it has on everybody's life, you know, whether you believe in climate change or not, weather and all these things impact on you. But your work is very colorful and playful, um, such as o, o Fortuna, Sandy Spins, and even the music O Fortuna is not a light, fluffy musical piece. So can you talk about the juxtaposition of that, of color and the con and the theme? Sure. So yeah, my work looks very playful. And um, if you were all to come into my studio physically right now, a lot of people, when they first come to the studio, they say, oh, it's fun. Oh, it looks so joyful. It looks like a toy store. And all that is deliberate. Uh, I make these pieces with lots of primary colors and a lot of them mimic 
construction toys, you know, a lot of what I hear when people see the work, oh, this is like connects, this is like Legos, this is, you know, I, I see toys. And part of that is to lure you into these pieces without immediately telling you, this is about an environmental disaster. This is about climate change. This is about a hurricane. And to kind of let you discover the numbers that are underlining, that are building these structures. So when you look at this, hurt, this roller coaster that's floating on this raft, that's a roller coaster that translates uh, wave height from Hurricane Sandy. So by riding the roller coaster literally up and down, you could tell, you can read off, oh, okay, so at 5 p.m., wave height was at 30, you know, 30 feet. At 6 p.m., it was 35 feet. And so the, 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 the roller coaster itself becomes almost like a three-dimensional graph, but then it's also sitting on a raft and it's holding this other wheel on top, the wonder wheel, which is Coney Island. And that translates data from Hurricane Sandy. So is this also, in a sense, a statement for the future? Will we be building these things on rafts of in, if we insist on having these amusement parks right at the edge of the water? Like, what does that say about our relationship with the coastal, with our coastal um, landscape and, and how that's changing with sea level rise and storm surges? So the playfulness does have a very dark side and that's, but it only, that darker side, I think only reveals itself after you kind of realize that this is all based on numbers and that you know, it is trying to suggest something for the future. I love the, the construction of that. Um, so I'm trying to figure out how to, to word this. So do you believe, I guess you do, you wouldn't be doing this, but that art can impact on social scientific issues, such as climate change or all the other issues that we're seeing? How, how do you do that? How do you impact? Yeah, so, I mean, I definitely think that my work changed dramatically, uh, not dramatically, that sounds really dramatic. Um, <laughs> my, change, my work has evolved. At the beginning, the work was very much about trying to understand science. So the pieces began with data. They were, the data sculpted the forms, like for example, this, this warpy thing here, right here, that's a very early piece. So it's all driven by data. Um, but I became more and more interested in how humans respond to weather and how humans respond to climate change. And so the work became more laden with metaphor and with, with um, you know, for example, the raft, that the whole thing, the, the, that this last piece was sitting on a raft. It's sort of this, is this sort of the absurd future that we're looking at? And in 2014, and that shift was sort of already starting to happen where I started with these very didactic pieces that, that, that more and more became absurd. And in 2014, I came across this really interesting article by Zadie Smith called An Elegy for a Country Season. It's by, it was in the New York Review of Books. And in it, she talks about how, you know, our seasons are changing, they're getting warmer, um, they're getting more extreme, either cold or warm. And um, we don't really have a lot of places or spaces to really talk about how this is impacting our own lives. And that the talk, the, this discussion on climate change is so often um, centered within either the scientific uh, dialogue or the political dialogue. And it, it just makes it very difficult for people to really engage with it. And so people don't talk about climate change. And yet it's impacting all of us. Uh, I mean, here in Boston, we have a lot of problems with sea level rise. You know, it doesn't make the national news, but if you're a homeowner, you're right by the, by the sea, you, you've noticed these, these changes. So I wanted to, um, so and one of the things that Zadie Smith appeals for or asks for in this, in this essay is that the arts can be a really good vehicle for bringing a more nuanced language about climate change, for, for, for allowing some of the absurdities or, or some of the kind of complicated responses that we have towards climate change to, to be vocalized, to be, to be voiced. And that's why I think the arts can be very powerful to bring this discussion on climate change back into the sort of personal experience. You know, it's still going to be always going to be in the political and the, and the scientific um, realm. But I think there needs to be another place where people can just talk about how it's affecting them. So when, you know, when somebody, I've, talk, I've talked to so many flooding um, survivors in the last few years, and 
when they tell me about how their home flooded, they're not throwing, they're not telling me some statistic and they're not telling me who they voted for. They're telling me what it was like to, to just find their home completely flooded and not knowing how to even rebuild and, and whether they should be rebuilding and the thoughts that, that went through their head as this, this storm surge came to their house. And that, that's sort of where I think, at least that's where I'd like to see my art is to give that experience some sort of, some sort of recognition because I think we're all complicated in our responses to climate change. Um, and I think that's a kind of a nuance, that complication that I think is really interesting to explore through the arts because it's maybe less judgmental, I don't know, um, but mm -hmm. it's, or maybe more honest. Well, I, we're about to, we're running out of time, but so I want to get to some of the questions, okay? And, and some of these will jump back to the beginning. And one of them is from Christina Peters. And she said, how did you begin the process, particularly with the students? when you were doing that? Oh. oh, okay, yeah, you mean the Hurricane Florence, yes. Uh, so I, I start with every um, workshop that I do that is about data translation, I start by asking them about their own experience with weather. So they all had to write, uh, a, a, they had to write a, a, a several paragraphs, one or two paragraphs about their experience in Hurricane Florence. What they went through, what, what it's, so what their experience was, what it, I asked them to describe it using their five senses. Um, you know, what was it like before, during, and after, and just to kind of start with their own story. And then with that, with their own story, then we start to uh, kind of pick things apart and say, okay, now, what was the rain like? And then they, when we talk about, well, was the rain always constant or was there a fluctuation in the rain? And then we go into sort of the nuances of, of the weather element. And then we talk about, well, if you had to, you know, paint one, a painting of what your experience of Hurricane Florence was, what would you choose? What, what's the one instant that kind of encapsulates the memory that you want to hold on to of, of that storm? So then they did a painting of that. And a lot of, a lot of the students actually continued writing onto the paintings. And then I had them all build houses and then woven houses and then they had so everyone had a woven house and then, then we incorporated weather elements of what they experienced the weather to be and then they had to decide well how does this how do we arrange them into an installation and then they they um i gave i i brought with them i brought each of the um classes a boat and then they have to figure out how to use the boat and blah 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 I'm, I'm going on and on but uh that's i always start with their story it, it has to start with them that is amazing. I love that. Um, a couple of people are asking about um, the materials that you use um, in your work. I, it looks like it's a little bit of everything, but what are some of the main things you use? So I use, I use reed, I use paper, I use lots of watercolor paper. I use wood, lots of wooden components. I tend to use materials that are not expensive because I wanna be able to mess up with them a lot of the stuff in the studio ends up in the dumpster out back. And so I have to be okay with letting go of that. And if I start working with material that's very precious, I'm gonna not be free to really play with it. So a lot of it is Home Depot stuff, Dick Blick stuff, um, Michaels, that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, Kathy Roy, hi Kathy asked about your time in Oberlin. She said, I was part of a shared fiber studio there called Ginkgo Gallery, but it was after you graduated. Oberlin is a unique and creative place. And she wondered what influence it may have played in your work. Uh, well, if, if you've been to Oberlin, Kathy, right? Is that her name, Kathy too? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, so it was impossible to get an art class while I was at Oberlin. I had to wait till my senior year to take one art class. And so it was my senior year, second semester that I was able to take one, my first, very, very first art class. It was a drawing class. And I absolutely loved it. I absolutely loved it. And the professor afterwards came up to me and said, yeah, you should be an art major. I'm like, yeah, well, I'm graduating. So <laughs> not gonna happen. Uh, but I think that, that, that really, left an impression on me. And of course the co-op system, Oberlin has this incredible co-op system <laughs> where 
you make your own food, you work with local farms, and I love that part. I think every college should have that system. <laughs> so Kathy, the person who went to Oberlin, I was in Fairchild Co-op, just in case. Okay, <laughs> Kathy Roy, I hope you got that. Um, somebody was asking about the Seasons book you mentioned. What is that again? Oh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an essay by Zadie Smith called An Elegy for a Country's Seasons. Thank you, all right. Um, she's, um, Karen LeBlanc said, your work tends to focus on environmental issues, but have you ever focused on man-made issues such as that cause floods or other disasters? Um, I guess I don't quite understand the question because some of the hurricanes, we could say we contribute to those, the ferocity <laughs> of them as well. Uh, I have mainly worked with weather events, whether that's a hurricane or whether that's a rain event or whether that's a river flooding. I have done river flooding. I've done sea level rise. So I guess water is sort of the common theme that goes through all of them. Um, and then some of the commissions that had to deal with um, privacy issues, I had to go into some his, his, uh, privacy surveillance and so forth. So I don't know quite how to answer that one because I don't quite understand what, what she means with man-made disasters. Well, somebody else just asked, are you interested in wildfires? That's kind of a man. -made. Oh, I see. Okay. No, I have, I, I absolutely, but I haven't done a piece on the wildfires, which I really okay. should. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is, we may be asking the same question twice, but um, somebody asked, what is your process? After accumulating your data, do you begin with the sketch or a small model before constructing your finer, final sculpture? I know you talked about the big installation, but for all the installations or all the pieces you do? So yeah, so the data and the sculpture are always sort of collaborating with each other. It begins, I actually have this pile of data sets right here to give you a sense of, it just literally starts with a whole bunch of sheets with numbers on them. That's like just tons and tons of data sheets. Um, so I begin with a day, I begin with compiling and gathering data, not just data. Let's say I'm looking at a, a storm like Hurricane Maria. So with Hurricane Maria, I'm gathering lots of weather data but I'm also reading newspapers. I'm also trying to understand how communities um, on the island are responding to the hurricane, not just right after the hurricane, but three or five months afterwards. So the, the data collecting isn't just numbers, it's also newspaper articles, anecdotal data, um, documentary films and so forth. And then I begin the translation process into a three-dimensional form, usually just with one or two data sets. Let's say I'll look at rain and wind for Hurricane Maria. And I'll just start with these two and I'll start a form. And then, then the form itself might suggest something else that I could add to the form that might really kind of flesh out, let's say the, 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 the motion of the hurricane. So then I'm gonna go back and find data that fits with the data that I've already translated, but I have to do a little bit more research. So it goes back and forth. And I don't necessarily start I don't know what the piece is really going to be about until the very end. So even though it starts off with, let's say, I'm going to make a piece on Hurricane Harvey, but then in the end, it's really about, it's really a piece about, um, you know, building codes pre-Hurricane Harvey that contributed to the devastation of the flooding. So it becomes much more nuanced as I build the piece and as I start getting more data into, as I gather more data. And that, that kind of refers back to what that other woman was asking about is, you know, man-made. Yeah, so that's true. Yeah. That's kind of, um, oh, this is a good question. Sue Zari, I think I'm pronouncing your name wrong, said, do you bring your material with you for an out-of-town installation project, or do you send studio assistants out on treasure hunts? <laughs> um, so if, if she means a project... Uh, so these, these pieces that I make are very time consuming. So the, the wall pieces take sometimes three months, four months. I've worked on them for more months. Um, so 
making a piece on site is, is not really possible. I have to do it all in, in the studio. And so um, if it's a big installation, either I fly out and I install it myself or I send instructions, like IKEA booklets types instructions uh, that tell the, the, the people at the museum how to put it together. I don't work with assistants because I can't afford assistance. And that was the next question. It says, do you, uh, Patricia, Betty wanted to know, do you work alone or do you hire people for larger projects? I work alone because yeah. that's the only way I can make it financially work. Somebody was asking, are you represented by any galleries? Not currently. I used to have gallery representation, but then I either fell away or I kind of walked away from, from the relationship. So not currently. Well, I can't believe it, but it's time to quit for the day. I can't believe this. This has been wonderful and so enlightening just to see art from your point of view. Thank you so much for sharing this today. And I'm, I'm so glad you were here. Thanks so much for having me and to ev everyone out there, stay safe and have a, have, a, have a great Thursday, Tuesday, whatever day we are today. It's the <laughs> pandemic, right? <laughs> All right, well, whatever day it is, I don't whatever know. Day it is. Well, thank you so much. And if you want to learn more about Natalie and her work, go to natalieneebach.com um, and you can see um, uh, her work that she's doing, projects she's done, a wealth of knowledge. And then if you also want to see her new work, the playful handwoven design works for home, you can see that at spidersandbirds.com. Um, and again, I want to thank our sponsors, the, the Woolery, um, they offer a large variety of fiber art supplies and a great knowledgeable staff. Um, thank you, Wave and Perry, uh, for sponsoring us today. Um, if you would like to sponsor your guild, um, your business, you as an individual would like to sponsor a textiles and tea, please go to our website, weavespindye.org, and you can sign up there. Textiles and Tea is supported by the generous donations to the Fiber Trust. If you want to see more programming such as this, please support HCA by becoming a member or donating or both at wespendie.org. If you want to watch this again or share it with a friend or if you want to go back and rewatch something, this is recorded on Facebook and you can go to the Ham Weavers Guild of America Facebook uh, page and watch it there. And again, you do not have to have a Facebook account to watch it. Um, next week, I'm so excited, we're going to have Lucianne Kaufman, artist and author who specializes in rep weave, and she's going to come have tea with us. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here today. I hope you have a wonderful week. Happy Valentine's Day, a little early, and happy tea.